Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like diamonds. We are back. This is going to be a fun episode. Got my main man, John Skinner. What's up, John? How you doing? Good to see you. I've been. Yeah, I've been um, so actually, you know, the, everything behind me is a mess because uh, I'm actually packing for Florida. In fact, I would have been down there, but that storm got in the way and i guess you must have been experiencing that uh, pretty recently so still am and if uh for those of you watching this um i have a door on my right behind my right shoulder and there's i'd say about a 60 percent chance that one of three kids will be busting through and breaking into the lock at some point so the kids are out of school yeah a nasty storm and it's been crazy let me actually i'm gonna stop so for those of you guys watching i'm sharing John Striper course. I'm going to stop sharing just so you can see it. We don't, you know, I feel like I'm watching one of your videos on my other screen about one jig and strip caught 43 bass in Rocky Beach. I was like, I kind of want to see John. There we go. <laughs> now, now I can see your, your, and you got all kinds of lures at the top. I guess oh, you, you, you can't around. even imagine. I, I, I hate to do this, but I'm going to turn this screen and see if I can. This Whoa. is, oh, it this is only, going. you're only looking at one wall. I, I <laughs> in front of me, it's off to the side. It's it's really out of control, but um, and hopefully I won't disconnect you here. But oh, that's yeah. awesome. That yeah, is awesome. That's what it looks like. Uh, yeah. All right, so let's go. We'll go back to the to the screen here, because today we're going to be talking all about stripers, stripe bass. We we did the course, or you did the course with us. It's uh, the other way around, and the thing took off. And I realized, wow, we never actually did a podcast or, or anything about it. I know you talk about it usually the beginning of all your videos. And I, I, I spent a little time in there this morning uh, because Luke and I are the first two people to get to watch John's course, which is awesome. And uh, I went back in just to see what some of the comments. So below every single video, so you can see here, they've broken down my modules. If you guys are, are listening in your car or working out, I'm, I'm showing the surf casting for striper course and it's broken down my modules each model module has multiple videos and this first one it's like 40 something minutes right the sand yeah 40 40 minutes on the dot right you know and that's one of the advantages of you know that's something you, you don't do on youtube you don't yeah. put up something that long and that detailed comprehensive so that's why i opened with that was because you know when i realized i, I was going to do the course and I said, all right, now I can go out there and really pick something apart. And one of the most common questions I get is, hey, I go to the beach. Where do I start? You know, and for a beginning surf caster, they go to a sand beach and to them, it all looks the same. You know, they see, you know, water and waves and miles and miles of beach and, and it looks the same to them. But to an experienced uh, striper surf caster, you know, you see all the little intricacies of, of the shoreline. And uh, so that's what I wanted to start with. And I had a beautiful situation here where I've got nobody on the beach. I've got miles and miles of beach. Oh, and you just ride with the truck and, and video the structure, but then get out and fish the structure. And uh, yeah, this just worked out so beautifully. And I thought it was a great start to the course. Yeah, the I finished this video and I was like, I'm done. Like, meaning I got, <laughs> I got all the, I got all the value I, I needed. It would be like, you know, how much would you pay to sit in the truck next to John to scope out the spots? And then obviously you go fishing, but uh, you talk, you talk through, I don't know if you guys listening can hear it on my audio or not, but yeah, he literally drives along the beach and points out, Hey, here's going to be the best spots. And I love the very first spot was kind of a bust. Um, if you recall, I know it's, yeah. it's, been a little while it was kind of a bust and then you moved over like 100 feet all of a sudden boom you found him you're like all right here's why that happened and here's right. why so many people would have stayed in that same spot and probably gotten gotten skunk because they were they were just 100 and 120 feet off from where yeah. all the feeding fish were you know one of the best questions i ever got in a seminar was a guy asked me he said uh how long do you stay in a spot before you you move and i said well probably two casts definitely not more than three casts and he and that was not the answer he expected you know he expected me to say half an hour or something but when you're in a situation now of course in a different environment there would be a different answer but in this kind of fishing if you, you don't get hit 
within a, the first couple of casts, you move, especially when you have varied beach structure. And that was a perfect example. You know, I get out of the truck, I look at it and uh, you know, there's nothing showing, there's no birds, there's no fish busting, everything is hidden. And uh, you start where you think, and if that doesn't work, well, you start making little adjustments and lo and behold, you find them. So let's, let's start right there then. So you're on a stretch of beach, it all looks the same, right? To most, to most eyes, it's like, oh, it just looks like one long beach. We always talk about the three B's, you know, for Florida, we're talking about birds and bait, you mentioned, and we talk about boils, you know, actually literally seeing fish out there boiling, or, you know, hitting, uh, hitting bait on the top. You didn't see any of that stuff. So oh, no, no, that's why I'm shaking my head a little bit. I'm going, no, no, no. That's yeah. Not... So, so why did you stop there? Like what, what well, makes most, you say, I mean, Hey, this is going to be a good spot. Uh, most striped bass that I catch there, there are no visual clues like the birds and the bait and the ball. No, it's just, it's not. Um, so it's, it's completely structure because these are structure oriented fish. Um, and you know, the first thing you're looking for, even at a distance is whitewater and, and also it's the shape of the shoreline. You know, you're looking for points. You're looking for that white water. And that's where I go driving along. And that's how this worked out really well is, you know, when you're driving along the beach at you know, 20, 25 miles an hour, you can cover miles of shoreline and you get to see all of the differences um, between some stretches. Hey, there were stretches of miles where I don't even slow down because I'm looking at that and it's boring. And not only is it boring, what you'll see is where it would be good, where you have some waves breaking on a bar, well, you can't reach the bar. I mean, if the bar is twice your casting distance, well, that's not gonna do you any good. Um, so you just keep riding, but then you get areas um, where, and, and hopefully we're all seeing the same thing here. I mean, there's a beautiful point structure. Look at all of that white water. You're seeing that, right? We're looking oh, yeah. at- yep. breaking yeah, we're point. yeah, I mean, that's, that's just gorgeous. And so if I'm looking at this, well, what's the best spot? I don't know, get out, you gotta get out and fish it. Um, if this is the, the point I'm thinking of, yeah, it's, it was the, the rougher corner off to the left. Um, whereas, yeah, to the right, that looks good because you can imagine waves breaking across the shallows, disorienting bait, and then the stripers sitting to the right-hand side there where it gets deeper. And uh, I, I think there were some there, but I think it was better actually in the rougher water on the other side. Uh, the fish were right in the turbulence. So you have to get out, you have to move across and fish it. I noticed too that you switched up your your bucktail, the 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 jig, uh, the weight, pretty quickly. Um, talk talk through that. Like you know, the one question you said was was great. That hey, how long do you stay in a spot? The other one is you know how how often are you changing your your weights? Well, you know, it's going to depend on um, you know, how much distance do I need. That's important. Yeah, I, like in this spot here, uh, I can picture fish being in pretty tight, the water is not too deep. I'm gonna start off with like three quarters of an ounce. But then if I start moving, even I, I think to the right of this, that bar is going to angle out and there's going to be deeper water, but I have to reach that bar and there is deeper water. So I can afford to go up to a slightly heavier bucktail. I know on the other side of this point, that water was rough. And yeah, you needed to get out there and certainly then I went up to heavier, but you know what, we're talking about weights and, but we're really only talking about a range of three quarters of an ounce being the lightest jig and an ounce and a half being the heaviest jig. You know, we're not talking, you know, one, two, three, four ounces or anything like that. We're talking about relatively subtle weight changes. Yeah, and I, I love this. I'm, I'm, st I'm not playing it purposely because I believe everyone's gonna be able to hear you talking. Yeah, and I, you're, John can't hear this, but I can. I believe the listeners can. But I thought this was so cool. Uh, you, you, it's like literally spending a uh, forty-five minutes in in each spot with you and seeing exactly how you fish it, and and most importantly, why? Like why you pick the spot? Why you have this lure? Why you're retrieving it a certain way? What you're what you're trying to feel on the bottom? What you're what you're trying to avoid? I thought that was awesome. I also I also appreciate this about you. So for those of you who don't know, you know, John creates all of this and this is all unique stuff that you can't find on YouTube. He builds the course out. We kind of help, you know, design it a little bit, but all the content's his. And then we help out with some of the, the sales page. 
and, and I had written down just because, you know, it, it's the marketing you and I talked offline about, you know, some of this YouTube stuff where you don't, you don't, you don't want to be like clickbaity, but at the same point, you don't want to have just some boring headline that no one ever even reads. Cause you got good content behind it to back it up. And so I put something about blitzing fish and you call me and you're like, Joe, take it off. Like I, that anyone could catch a striper when they're blitzing and it's just, it's easy. He's like, I'm talking about the average day when it's tough out there. I'm trying to get people to have consistent bites all, all the time, not just when they, when they find some crazy. So you, you told me to, to strike it and uh, we took it out. So I, I appreciate that about you. Yeah. In fact, you know, I have to say, uh, Yes, it's exciting to get it on a blitz. Like where I live out on the North Fork of Long Island in the fall. Um, yeah, sometimes you, you go up to the bluff, you go to a beach and hey, the birds are there and the fish are busting and oh yeah, you go and you go have some fun. In fact, um, one of the videos I put up recently, uh, yeah, it, was, uh, it, it wasn't a real grinding blitz, but actually there was blitz action in that video, but that was the only video for the year that I put up that way. Yeah, it's fun, um, but it's not as satisfying as going to a situation like this with no visible cues from the fish or the birds or anything like that, and and figuring it out and and catching and catching extremely well by just reading the water. Yep, there's one right there. Yeah, you caught a few right in this uh, in this little spot here. Let's see if I can shrink this down. The other one though this is the second video in the course and this is another 20 minutes of just map reading you know spot selection on uh, on different satellite maps um and you can see here below everyone has questions and john answers every single question i, I forgot to read this one on the on the first video actually i guess there's an intro video with another 40 something questions but it says john i'm a long time subscriber i was skeptical that there would that there would be much more information that I've gotten from the fact that I've seen all your videos and read all your books several times each. I can already see from the first few videos that this course truly does offer something unique. Very good work. I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this, but is there any adjustments you would make to utilize this information in New Jersey? And of course you respond there. And, and I, I think you'll agree with me here. The books are powerful anything in text, right? There's a reason that, that so many people read magazines and go to forums and in Facebook groups, but there's just something unique about actually seeing someone fish a real spot. Oh, I told you, what did I tell you, John? <laughs> there we go. Percent. So if you guys are watching, what do you got? You got something on you? Oh, I got it. Kids are home, uh, home from school. You say hi to Mr. John. Oh, he's up here. Hello. He's up here. Jackson likes to catch. He he says he likes to catch bass, but you know we're talking about Florida bass, not a large mouth. All right, buddy. <laughs> Never, you know, before this it was COVID, and now it's uh, you know hurricane. Yeah. <laughs> well, unfortunately, it uh, there'll probably be some more COVID on the backside of the hurricane too. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. All right, so back back to this the the we talked about the power of books the power of of written material and then when you tie that in this is this guy michael here's a great example tying that in with seeing someone do it on the water uh i mean that's that's so powerful and i'm not talking about like you know a nine minute youtube video where you get to see the highlights right I'm talking yeah. about like and the good the bad the ugly yeah that's the thing and and you know I, i've often said you can't express in words what you can show. I mean, when you can show somebody, and then you know what? You can't do what's done in this course on YouTube videos. YouTube videos are these, you know, they're, the whole thing is kind of disorganized. I mean, yeah, you have a trip, and yeah, you can definitely learn great stuff from the YouTube videos. However, pulling it all together and making it comprehensive and having it flow, and you just, you know, you, you can't. So I almost, I, I laugh and I get annoyed when people say, oh, it's going to just be the same stuff on, on YouTube. Hey, you know what? I reuse some of the footage I put up on YouTube because it's great footage. You know, so I will use some of that to demonstrate things. But even if I had never recorded extra stuff for the course, which I recorded a lot of extra stuff, yeah. um, this still would be way better than having to go through 
200 YouTube videos to figure pull the different things out, you know, just to, to reorganize the bits uh, of the YouTube videos really adds a lot to the course. But yeah, now I'm able to just, um, you know, show stuff that, oh, and you know, there's another thing and, and it has to do with spot burning. And um, I feel like, I mean, look, there's, I've got a lot of good video that I simply will not put on YouTube because there's backgrounds. I, and you know, it's, I often think about the other guy. It's not so much me. Look, if I burn my own spot, oh, well, you know, yep. but I worry about um, the innocent guy who just fishes an area. And then, you know, I capture that on video and put it on YouTube and burn it. I, so that for that reason alone, I won't do it. But in some of these places, um, I, I've been able to put up some stuff into the course that I simply would never have done on YouTube. And certainly... Um, one of the, the last, I don't know, I don't, I, I'm not sure whether it's the last, yes. Yeah, I think it's in the, in the bonus, right? We put oh, it yeah. Well, that was something, <laughs> yeah, that's a special thing there. Yeah, we can't show that one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, Unless of course you're, you, you're a subscriber to this course. Right. Yeah. That's uh you know, that's a case where I've had people tell me they've spent hours trying to figure out, you know, where <laughs> that was and everything. And, and the answer is nobody else was on it. And I knew that because I was the only one who fished it for years. And then I moved and I've got other spots closer to me. So I don't fish it anymore. So, you know, I didn't flat out burn it, but there are some visual clues in there where people familiar with the area might be able to figure it out. But um, that segment is about how I found that spot using the kayak, the troll tube and worm in tight to the beach. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very convincing, but certainly something in a million, no, no matter how much anybody paid me, I would never put that up on YouTube. Yep. And, and so, even in the course, I mean, it's it, it, like that gentleman's question about, you know, New Jersey and about fishing other types of areas. That's what, that's what it's all about. This course is about right. trying to find the best types of spots in your area to recreate it. Not about, Hey, here's a GPS spot. That that, that's right. Go. But, yeah. but, and that, that bonus content shows how, yes, it was great. an example of how I found that spot because I know that spot, I did a lot of videos there, a lot of big bass on plugs. And, you know, there was a lot of people would have liked to have found that, but it shows how I found it and how you can apply that to find things in other places, because it's a technique of, of doing that. And then, um, yeah, and, you know, it's how you find them. And, and the thing is about that kind of a place, you will never ever see fish busting. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, these fish are hunkered down on structure they don't show. Um, you'll walk by it. You'll never think about it. But you know, there's ways to find these areas where the fish hold. And they were there. Yeah, th those were those are the two first videos I saw because you'd sent me the bonus one, and I was like, I got to watch this. The one if you guys are, are you can't see this, it's the one way to find shore honey holes, honey holes in shore, uh, and then the sand beaches. Uh, Awesome. So out of all these types of spots, we got sand beaches, rocky shorelines, bays, creeks, and inlets. What's like, what do you recommend people start with? If, if someone's listening and they're may, not, not a complete beginner, maybe, but just someone who's just not as consistent as they want. Is there one that's just been easier than, than others? Is it going to depend on where they are? Uh, depend on the time of year. I, I don't know because I'm not a striper expert. What what do you recommend here for these different types? It, it, it depends. It depends on where they are. And um, so I can tell you like where I live, it's almost inconvenient to fish sand beaches just because I'm on the North Fork of Long Island. I have to somehow get over to the South Shore, which is, you know, take two ferries or I have to drive around the, the water in the middle. Um, on the other hand, I can walk down the, the end of my street and be on a rocky shoreline. So the first thing I would say to people is start close to home. And this is something I've always preached is that you're better off learning a mediocre spot really, really well than scattering your efforts among these top shelf places that you read about in the magazines and everything else uh, because if it takes you too much time to get there, you can't put a sustained effort on it. You can't learn it uh, really closely. 
So, you know, I always say, you know, start close to where you are and, and work your way out. So if you live in a place that's, you know, like this, well, then that's, you know, what I would be focusing on first. Actually, you know, a course like this, I don't, I don't remember how many hours long it is. Frankly, I would just take it, you know, a course like this, I would just go start to finish and, and work yep. it all the way through. Um, because the, one of the coolest things about striper fishing is that they are in so many different environments. I mean, you've got everything from the quietest back bays to the roughest surf and then everything in between the rocky shorelines, the inlets. And in a lot of the striper coast, um, you are relatively close to all of these things. I mean, yeah, it's more convenient for me to fish where this is, but yeah, in, in less than an hour, I can be up on the ocean sand beaches or I could be in an inlet. And certainly I can be in the back bays as quickly as I can be on this rocky shoreline. So those different environments across uh, many parts of the Striper Coast are available to everyone. I keep fast forwarding here to, okay, there it is. It's like, where's the Striper? It looks like you're still using a bucktail here, even in all this uh, structure with all these rocks. Uh, huh? Yeah, yes. And that's something that... Um, I, on the latest YouTube video that I posted from the beach, I wanted to make really clear is that, yeah, you fish bucktails in the heaviest, nastiest, rocky areas. And I know I didn't lose any bucktails this year. I don't recall whether I lost any last year. And you see what I'm fishing in. But the whole thing is you swim, you glide that bucktail above the structure, and you use a bucktail that's made to do that, something that's a little bit bulkier that is suited for swimming above the structure, as opposed to something like a fluke bucktail. When we're fluke fishing, hey, we want that thing to have minimal drag, get to the bottom with the lightest, you know, thinnest line. But with striper fishing, no, you know, if you're casting into very rocky areas like this, and I'm only hitting maybe 10 feet of water, uh, that bucktail has to glide and swim at a reasonable retrieve speed, you know, slow to moderate retrieve, and be able to keep it out of the rocks, but it's just deadly. It's uh, absolutely another one here, back to back. Um, and it, this is this is one of your bucktails, I assume, right? One of the sure. Oh, and okay. you know, I and I always have a disclaimer that hey, there's plenty of good bucktails out there on the market. Um, these came from. I, I was picky. I tied my own for many years, and the difference in mine were that they had a little more deer hair, but they also had the hackle feathers tied to the hook shank. So if you look at a typical bucktail without the feathers, you kind of have a hollow spot in the middle because you tie the hair to the collar of the jig, but then it's kind of hollow in the middle where the hook shank is. Well, I fill that out with hackle feathers and that's the way I always made my bucktails. I pretty much didn't use anybody else's very rarely. Um, so then I had mentioned to uh, SNS Bucktails, I said to the guy Stanley who runs us, hey, can't you tie them this way? And he's like, well, yeah. And then one thing led to another. And, you know, so now, um, you know, they're produced uh, with my name on them. And uh, yeah, so that's, I, I definitely prefer them, but there's plenty of good Bucktails out there on the market that you'll catch with. You're a modest guy. You, I say you got to have the John Skinner's back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's cool. I love this. Another one. Yeah, and these are schoolies, you know, this isn't yeah. showing uh, big bass. There are other parts of the course, certainly in the in the surface plugging and all that, you know, show quality stripers. All right, so I'm going to go to bays because you mentioned sometime, yeah, like how, look how calm that is compared to what you were just in. Right, and, uh, you know, you had mentioned different times of the year. Well, our seasonal progression up here is that we start um, the, in the early spring, which is roughly like the beginning of May, end of April, uh, in these back bay areas. And you want to get the areas, they're fairly shallow bays, and they warm up first from nice sunny days. And um, so that's where we start the season. And I, I, I start in the bays, and I probably fish those uh, end of April and May into most of June, but then I'm out of the bays after that for stripers and into the sound, the ocean. And when does the season end for you? I know there's some that uh, maybe extended a little bit longer. Uh, so there's fishing is still going on. Uh, I know even yesterday 
looking off the end of the street, I see schools of fish that they're not on the beach though. They're, they tend to push off a little bit farther. And so, you know, the boats can get at them, but um, they're not so much on the beach, but yeah, the fishing is still possible for another couple of weeks yet. What was interesting is, I, you know, we get to see these courses and you would think that the major or all of it, really all of the, the, these course sales would happen like in the peak of the season and a lot of it happens in the winter time like two of our best months are december and uh in january which and i think a lot of people are just you know the kind of at home the weather's kind of crummy uh and even getting into february uh it's been really interesting that's been five years running a lot of people are you know because they they want to they want to get ready right they're 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 getting geared up they're trying to just at least live vicariously through uh, through other fishermen as much as they can. I thought that was really fascinating. Um, okay, well, you know, the best thing you can do to, to be a, um, a productive angler is to um, utilize that downtime to learn. And whether it's through, you know, something like this or books or whatever it is, uh, you've, you've got, oh, it, and here it's terrible. You know, we've got um, an off season that's over five months long. You know, even if you fish stripers till the end of December, you know, you still have then December, January, February, March, pretty much April. I mean, you have pretty much a solid five months, uh, which is why I'm now wintering down in Florida, because <laughs> that's a big chunk of your life not to be fishing, you know. And uh, yeah, so to be able to utilize that time. And, and, you know, one of the things that has always been good about the winters here is that we have the fishing shows. Those are tremendous opportunities for people to learn because you've got a lot of seminars and, and then you've got all of the different kinds of gear. And I've got to tell you, as somebody who does a lot of seminars, you don't want to do a crap job at that. So, you know, you, you do your best and you put out a lot of information in those. And, um, but now there's COVID. There are, I, I don't know what the situation is in Florida, but over here they canceled, uh, pretty much all the shows got canceled last year. They're already canceling the shows for this year. Mm. So I would be totally shocked if there were any seminars, any big shows um, up in the Northeast this winter. So um, unfortunately that's gonna be a big educational loss for anglers um, not having those shows. Well, but, the good, good news, you can go to saltstrong.com forward slash Skinner and see your uh, two courses with us. And you will, uh, if you, if you watch every video from start to finish, I, I, maybe I'm going on a limb here, but I mean, I, I believe you'll know more than 90 something percent of, of all weekend warrior anglers out there uh, in terms of you got the one for fluke and then you have the, this surf casting for stripers. I mean, it's, it is packed. It, it is. And, you know, I just mentioned that. <laughs> so when you do a, when you do seminars, you don't want to do a crap job. When you do this, you don't want to do a crap job either. So you really and the same thing goes with writing books. You know, you really put everything you can into it. You know, when you're banging out a, a YouTube video or two a week, I'm not saying you wing it, but, um, you know, it, it's a little less. You're a little more rushed. Whereas something like this is a project and I like big projects like this because you can really go over it, you can refine it and you can put out a, a very high quality product. And when you're charging money and have a 365 day money back guarantee, it's gotta be good. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know what? I, I don't do it because I'm afraid people are gonna want their money back. Yeah. Um, I'm more, I would be more concerned that um, you know, people wouldn't be satisfied, but yeah, fortunately, uh, yeah, the money back guarantee, very, very few people. Uh, and I'm thinking about, you know, when was the last time I even saw a refund request? It just, you know, it, it's not happening, but it's there. You know what, if you're not sure, um, Hey, you can check it out. If you don't like it, you can get your money back. That's, that's awesome. There, there was, there was, I think there was one, I'll call him a jack wagon. Cause you know, that is this the guy that gets in there? I know all this stuff, right? Uh, yeah, right. Uh, but they're there and he got all his money back. Um, I love the part too, that it's interactive. And uh, you know, there's many times where someone will ask a question that 
they're like, man, that's, that's worth going out and, and, and actually, you know, adding to the, uh, the course. So the beauty, and that's another reason we don't do DVDs. We get that question. Hey, why don't you guys send DVDs in the mail? Well, DVDs, they're static, right? You, you can't change them. You can't alter them. And of course, if you scratch them or crack them or have kids like me break them, they're, uh, they're kind of useless. Uh, whereas this it's online, you can watch it anywhere and it's interactive and it updates and you get to see all the other people's questions. I mean, just on this one video alone on inlets, you got 19 questions here and John replying to all of them. I, I think that part is, is really, really cool. Um, I want to move on to, to lures and tactics. Clearly in a lot of these videos, we've just been kind of skimming through, you're using a bucktail. I know that's, that's your confidence lure. It's your, uh, it's, I assume it's the one you lead with in most cases. No, what, actually, what, um, not? It, it depends on the situation. It, it's really two things. It's, it's pencil poppers and bucktails are, those are really, that's, you know, that's the two. Yeah. And talk, walk me through when to use each one. I got a 12 minute video on, uh, poppers. So these are the, the thing about pencil poppers is, um, I think about them as being almost like fish finders for surf casters. And the reason is that you can get you know, tremendous casting distance with them, but they also tend to, I mean, look at this, it's flat glass calm. You know, you saw the rough ocean surf, but these conditions here can you, are- can you see how far out the, the lure looks like it's a mile away. <laughs> yeah, no, so you're able to cover a lot of water with a pencil, but the thing is pencil poppers tend to pull up fish that aren't actively feeding. And here's the great thing, you, you don't need the fish to eat your plug to know that a fish is there because what's gonna happen is even if they don't grab it, there's a good chance they're gonna come up and just take a look and they're gonna leave a boil behind the lure. So if you're trying to search out areas to find fish, the pencil popper, you know, you've got that you know, visual reaction when a fish comes up behind the lure, whether it hits it or not, just the boil, that's, that tells me, hey, I see that boil. I'm as excited as if I hooked the fish because, hey, I know they're there, you know? So I know that, you know, there's fish in that area. So it's very, it's a very good search tool. That's a cool image right there. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big fish, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the ones, yeah, right. So, um, you know what, I'm not reaching that fish with a bucktail, just, you know, yeah. where it's hitting. And um, quite frankly, in this calm water, not much current, very clear water, a fish like this, yeah, you might get them on a bucktail, but the thing is with a pencil popper is that it tears up the surface of the water. It's hard for the fish to get a good read on. They can't quite see exactly what that is because it's thrashing back and forth. It looks like a big injured meal, but they can't see it clearly because it's ripping up the top of the water and they hit it. Yeah, it's that simple. <laughs> Love it. And we still got another nine minutes or so to go. Oh, so now, now you're using it on the, right. the surf. Yeah. Right. So I, I keep saying pencil poppers and uh, it's to the point that about 90% of the time, yeah, if I'm using a popper, it's a pencil popper, but there are um, many other good ones on the market as well. These super strike little necks are, uh, if I'm not using a, a pencil, I'm probably using a super strike little neck because they are also very good plugs. Cool. So you got the minnow plugs, you mentioned soft plastics, um, but it sounds like if you just want to simplify, you got bucktails and poppers. If, if you well, just here's where it gets a little more complicated is okay. it, if you're night fishing, then those poppers go pretty much out the window. Now, there's always somebody who says, oh, but, you know, I've caught fish on poppers at night. Fine. But there, that's not a, a main night lure. The night lures, that's the minnow plugs, the daughters, the bottles, the needles. Um, you know, that's those are really more... Um, of the night lures yeah you get a little bit of florida footage there because yeah i was like that looks like uh yeah. some man mangroves yeah, what, are, what are those mangroves doing up here um <laughs> so i was demonstrating lure action uh especially with the minnow plugs and uh, trying to show what the um yeah what what the action should look like on the lures um but yeah those uh, so it's going to depend uh, and then when you get into the minnows there's all different kinds 
Um, and you know, it's funny. So you look at that one. First of all, look how terrible. Hey, that particular plug is a killer. Look at the finish. There's no finish. <laughs> Zero. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it had a finish at one time. Um, <laughs> but so that's a bomber. And if you look at a bomber compared to a Daiwa Salt Pro, those lures look extremely similar, very much the same. And I can remember the first time I saw a Daiwa Salt Pro, I was like, I already got bombers. What do I need these for? <laughs> well, those plugs are quite different. You know, the Salt Pro casts farther. It handles rougher water. The bomber is um, a better shallow lure. So, you know, to and that's what the you know the course covers that contrasting the different kinds of minnow lures because they all have their their different places. This is so cool. You got a bunch of them there. All right. Um, and then when. We talked about it a little bit, but let's let's talk about tides, current, have them flow. What are your? Uh, yeah, it's going to be. It's, we it's, got a seven without saying all eighteen minutes that you cover in here. Yeah. So, all right. So I can see this is an inlet shot, and so yeah. let's talk about currents, especially in areas with significant current. What you you know, and here's an inlet, and you can see that water is ripping. Um, what you find is a, a lot of the bites, um, it depends on, on the location. Some areas are going to produce well on the fastest water. A lot of the inlets where you've got really fast moving water, um, it's going to be 90 minutes either side of high tide because if you're approaching, you, know, you really, and I don't mean to say high tide, uh, let's say slack water. It's really not so much of a focus on tides as it is current and current yeah. speed. And you're thinking about when is slack current. So if I'm thinking about high slack water, um, the window that I want to fish in this particular spot is 90 minutes prior to high slack and then 90 minutes on the other side of the, the first not hour and a half of the outgoing current. Um, and actually, you know, I'm saying high as an example, low is good too. Um, so it's really 90 minutes either side of a high or low slack um, rule of thumb. That's a good time to be fishing because what that is, is that is a period of time where the current speed is changing. And you could be fishing for hours in the middle of the tide, nothing happening, nothing happening. And then all of a sudden that water starts slowing down and it's like somebody flipped a light switch mm -hmm. and start hitting. And when I fish these inlets, yeah, I never want to miss fishing it through a slack period, catching those times when the current speed is changing. No, that's critical. We, we did that recently in a Jupiter, you know, which is a popular inlet here for the big snook. And we fished, it was probably two hours and it was just brutal. And we were, you know, using jigs and we're just like, I mean, I'm talking nothing. And, and then all of a sudden, it was, it looked, looked like a, 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 a light switch and we were all, all three of us, boom, boom, boom. It was just like, it was nuts. Same lures, nothing else had changed except it was probably right at that 90 minute mark. It had slowed right. down you know just what? enough where the fish were, because the fish are kind of lazy. Like they don't want to work that hard for it when the thing's just ripping. And uh, we knew they were down there and all of a sudden it was, it was on. Well, it's not just, it's not only late, it's biology. I mean, they can't, you look at this water, it's screaming. You can't, they cannot afford to hmm. expend more energy getting their prey than they get from their prey. <laughs> right. They need to take advantage of these times where that water slows down. And something I like about the snook is they are um, kind of similar to stripers in a lot of ways with, with the currents and everything. So when I went down to Florida, I picked up the snook and the redfish real easily because it was quite a bit like striper fish. Yeah. And so when are you coming back down to, to Florida pretty soon, huh? Right. I'm leaving uh, the day after tomorrow. So I expect to be down there pretty soon. Um, got a long drive. Going to be dragging a 30 year old uh, Maverick flats boat. <laughs> nice. You got it, huh? Yeah. Going to repower that thing down there. And uh, cool. in the meantime, I'll, I'll have my kayak. So uh Looking forward to the. I, I miss the the redfish and the snook. <laughs> a lot of fun. they are they are here, my friend. And you know, because we've had that closure on the Gulf Coast for for quite some time, I, this has been a really really good year. 
uh, and at least on the on the golf side in, in St. Pete and even down in uh, Placida, a little bit closer to where you are in that Port Charlotte area, it's been good. So, well, that's that's good, and it'll be fun because I've never been down there in the fall, so I have no idea what happens down there in the fall. Oh, it's fun, big big baits and big fish. So, um, everyone, please, 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 if you haven't already. Go to saltstrong.com forward slash Skinner. You can see John's two different courses there. And we have, we talked offline about a potential new course. I don't know if you want to do a teaser there real quick, but uh, a, a third course in the, and kind of in the works here. Sure. I'll, um, so, you know, we talked about bucktails and yeah. they, they catch so many species of fish. Yes. And what I would like to do is a bucktail mastery course that ties in the Florida stuff because, yeah, you know, I went down to Florida and sure, the snook and the reds and, and the tarpon, uh, you know, they hit the bucktails too. And um, then I can also work in some things like, it's a northern thing, but for blackfish jigging, porgy jigging, um, something that I wasn't, that I didn't cover in the bucktail book, but Again, you know, comparing the bucktail book to the course, there'll be many things I can do uh, with the course that, you know, simply can't be done in print. And uh, I'll be able to work in the Florida stuff. And I think that will turn out to be a really good course. I think it'll be huge, my friend. So everyone uh, stay tuned for that. Leave us a comment. If you want to see this bucktail course, bucktail master, we'll probably call it or any, anything else that you have questions on with, surf casting for stripers let us know and of course if you're in the course that's found at saltshore.com forward slash skinner then you can ask questions right there it's all interactive and john always gets back with you sometimes it might take a week or so especially when you're traveling and moving all your stuff down to florida but he always gets back and uh it, it is a phenomenal phenomenal course and everyone in there seems to absolutely love it so we appreciate you my friend and uh i'm looking forward to the next one all right thanks for having me joe Thanks, John. If you're new to Salt Strong, just know that we're the online fishing club that'll help you catch more inshore saltwater fish than ever before while saving time and money on all the tackle you need. To learn more, go to saltstrong.com. Otherwise, hope to see you again soon. There's something about the water that'll give you peace all by yourself or with your family. Live Salt Strong and wear the line today.